So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Be the Match. When I started out, it was a National Mural Donor Program. Those are a lot of words to say. We call it NMDP. And we changed it to Be the Match because, as you've just heard, you don't always have to have a marrow transplant. You can get these stem cells from a lot of different places. And we also put the emphasis on be the match. Find someone who can match you and be a donor for you. Okay? We're going to talk about the types of transplants. You've heard a lot about this. And maybe this will be a nice little summary to pull it all together for you. When your physician and you should consider finding an unrelated donor transplant, and I'll talk about finding a real person, an adult person around the world, but also I'll tell you a little bit more about the cord blood. So there are so many options now, it can be a little dizzying to figure out which and what and how and what. And a little bit about the behind the scenes that goes on. If your doctor said, let's try to see if you have a perfectly matched unrelated donor, well, what happens? What's that process? And then uh, Dr. Stiff asked me to tell you a little bit about some of our assistant programs. We have a very large patient education program at Be The Match. It's not just for people that are undergoing an unrelated or cord blood transplant. It's for everyone. Autologous transplant, allogeneic transplant. We cover every disease for which a transplant is ever utilized. So I want to tell you a little bit about the resources that we have for you. And then just what I think, looking back over 30 years, that I wish I was going to be alive in another 30 years just to see what's going to happen, because I think the advances that are coming along are really going to change um, the world and, and change the, the future for patients that have blood diseases and their families. So Be the Match really is dedicated to patients. And the match is right here. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. You heard from our earlier speaker about these HLA antigens, you know, what we want to match for. It's not the blood type. It's something else. And so that's kind of what we're known for. I want to draw your attention. What's in the middle? And the middle is research. And that's what also the Leukemia Foundation is based on, really about research, because research drives the field. There's just no doubt about it. And some of the studies um, that you heard about, about the haploidentical transplant and work is being ongoing, that's what we help facilitate. Um, we, our research program is called the Center for International Blood and Marrow Transplant Research. It's an international program, and we help facilitate all of these trials, either looking back at what we've accomplished with transplant or going forward. And so we're helping to facilitate trials right now comparing haploidentical transplant to core blood. We're starting trials for sickle cell disease. We're still taking trials for myelofibrosis. How can we make transplant better? That's the core of everything that we do. And then behind the scenes, you're doing an unrelated transplant. We help find that donor, whether or not it's a cord blood or a person, and we get those cells to you and your doctor when you need them. I have a major interest in survivorship. I led the late effects clinic, I actually started it at the University of Minnesota, and more and more centers are starting to pay more attention to, you're just not a transplant patient, you're a patient, you're a person. And we want to know what matters to you after transplant. Just not that you're cured, but other things, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So we're very much interested in helping patients lead a normal life after transplant. We also have a full financial department and they work very closely with payer groups. Transplant's expensive, have you noticed? <laughs> it costs money. It costs money to even find a donor if you need an unrelated donor, and this is always unbelievable to me, but some insurance um, policies say that if you can find a donor, you can have a transplant, but we won't pay for you to find a donor. Well, we have search funds to help with that too, and we're working very closely uh, we've just finished working with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid to help identify three diseases for which they say that if we can conduct studies showing that it's beneficial for patients, they will pay for it, and they're going to pay for those clinical trial access. It's going to be for myelofibrosis, patients with multiple myeloma that need an allogeneic transplant, and for sickle cell disease. So those are the kind of things that we do. We're a little bit more than just find you a donor. We really want to help transplant centers and patients. 
So as you just heard that behind the scenes, we uh, located across from Target Field in downtown Minneapolis. So I doubt that you'll be coming to a Twins game this year because as you know, we're kind of like the losingest team uh, in the league. If you're coming to see the opponent, we're right across from Target Field and really we're just full of people that are wanting to help you on a daily basis. So you've heard a bit about the types of transplant and cell sources, but I don't know about you, but I have to hear things a few times to, to, to make it settle in. And autologous transplant really uh, was the beginning of transplantation, using your own cells. And historically, it was using your bone marrow. And along came in the 1990s, we found that growth factor. You've heard of neupogen, colony stimulating factor. That was discovered as a naturally made hormone in our body, and they learned how to make it and manufacture it and put a little vial, okay? And then you can stick it under your skin, kind of like an insulin shot, and you can make those cells come out in the bloodstream. I remember I was in the operating room doing a bone marrow harvest, you know, taking the bone marrow out, and we were talking about the work that had been published. We thought, gosh, you think it's really gonna change transplant? And it did, because we could get cells that come out of the bone marrow into the bloodstream, and voila we can offer an autologous transplant to patients that had cancer in their bone marrow because we could take their cells out of the bloodstream. What an advance. It was in the 1990s. Okay? So there still are diseases, and I'm going to show those to you, and your doctor will help you decide whether or not an autologous transplant, such as multiple myeloma, people have cancer in their bone marrow, right? You can take the cells out and do the bloodstream. So for some diseases, that's the number one type of transplant. The disease comes back after an auto, we often think about an aloe. And for some diseases, an allogeneic transplant really is the best type for you. And again, from the bone marrow, the bloodstream, that can be a family member, a perfectly matched family member, or a haplo, half matched. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about cord blood. I've lived through the cord blood age. And so parents donate the umbilical cord. You can take stem cells out of that. You can typically get enough cells to do a transplant, particularly for a child. At the University of Minnesota, we sorted out, it was Dr. John Wagner's team, that the reason that cord blood wasn't working as well in adults is you needed more cells because we're bigger, okay? And so we figured out you could put two together. Have you ever heard of a double umbilical cord blood transplant? Because you need more stem cells. And so that really revolutionized work as well. It really, for the first time, started crossing HLA barriers because you don't have to have a perfect match to do a cord blood transplant. So it opened up the field. And now, most recently, is haplo. So this just shows you the number of transplants that's really been rising. I started back here. <laughs> And I was at the University of Iowa, uh, so I was right here. I think Dr. Stiff is close to me. Pat, when did you start? 1980. 1980. So he and I are right here. And if you invite me back in a few years, my slide won't have us on it. <laughs> but look what's happened. And a lot of this with, I told you, the 1990s, those growth factors. So look how autologous transplant just started blowing up. And then allogeneic has really come along, continuing to rise. So this is the number of total transplants. We collect data from all over the world, all over the world. Um, in fact, one of my colleagues who came last year is in Iran this week because those patients don't have access to transplants. We think that science and medicine and helping people should rise above politics, but that is another thing that NMDP works for. And so in 2014, it's estimated that over 200,000 folks have had autologous transplants and over 150,000 have had allogeneic transplants. So there's a lot of people that have had transplants. And this is the reasons for transplant. You've heard this morning that patients should be considered for an autologous transplant for multiple myeloma, although I really wonder whether or not it's going to be necessary. And you didn't talk about that too much, but you did show us how many, Dr. Tell shows us how many drugs have been FDA approved for multiple myeloma. And I think they'll either be used in combination with transplant or maybe transplant won't even need to be done anymore. You heard about chronic myelogenous leukemia and those new drugs you can take by mouth. That really decreased the number of allogeneic transplants that were done. But multiple myeloma is the number one indication right now for an autologous transplant using your own cells and that's taking the cells out of your bloodstream. 
But if the disease comes back, or if it's really, really, really aggressive, sometimes an allogeneic transplant is used. The next most common indication or reason for a transplant, an autologous, and that's the green, are the lymphomas, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and Hodgkin's lymphoma, named after Thomas Hodgkin. So Thomas got some diseases, and all the rest were the non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. Allogeneic transplant is typically used for leukemia. So using either a matched sibling, a matched unrelated transplant, a cord, a haplotransplant, okay? CML, chronic myelage of leukemia, was the number one indication, number one reason for an allogeneic transplant when I started. And now the pills like Gleevec they can take, really plummeted, really using it for really aggressive ones or people that don't respond to that. Myelodysplastic syndrome uh, is kind of a, a pre-leukemia. Chronic lymphocytic leukemia is not very commonly used for it. But what's really been changing are the aplastic anemias and these other non-malignant, particularly in children, and sickle cell disease. We talked about this a little bit earlier this morning, but when I first started autologous transplants, um, I think people were really in the 40s or, the, or their 50s, but Allogeneic transplant, I'm going to show you in the next slide, has really changed. But with the advent of new drugs, not as many are being done uh, for less than 60 years of age of patients who can really tolerate more intensive regimens. But look at this, that autologous transplant, there really is no upper age limit. You've heard that today. It's really on the overall health of a patient. And the same thing by allogeneic transplants. This is the greater than 60 years of age, the green, just continuing to rise. So your age should not be a reason to have a transplant, not to be able to have one. And we just finished doing a survey of transplant centers across the United States, and the majority did not have an upper age limit, either for autologous transplant or for allogeneic transplant. So let's talk a little bit about the transplant process. It's long, isn't it? <laughs> you know, when you start thinking that you've got to get ready for the transplant and get your disease under control before you can even be considered for one. But before the transplant, and this is typically the, the first seven to ten days, you undergo what's called a conditioning regimen or preparative regimen. And that's really to decrease the number of cancer cells that you still may have in your body that can be really hard to detect. You hopefully are in a remission. That's kind of the best possibility. But this is an area where there's really been a lot of changes over, the, over time, and I wanted to talk about that a minute in the next couple of slides. Day zero is your, your new birthday. It's really exciting. You worked really hard to get there. And a lot of things are being done with those cells that go in that have changed over time. You've heard a little bit about this graft versus host disease. That's when the new cells, if you're getting someone else's cells, they recognize your body as being stranger. And it's good because it can attack cancer and keep the cancer from coming back, but it also can attack you, and that's what we don't want to happen. And there's new ways. We're conducting um, a research study now through the Clinical Trials Network that is looking at three different ways to help prevent that graft-versus-host disease. And how we're going to do that is by taking out some of the cells that can, can do it, or new drugs right in this time frame that can help prevent graft-versus-host disease. So that's going to be a great trial looking at three different ways to help prevent graft-versus-host disease. The other advances that have occurred, that same growth factor that can get the cells to come out into the bloodstream to use for a transplant, well, what's happened over the past decades since those were developed, they can make the cells grow in faster after the transplant. And so they're used to help in graftment. One big thing is that when we started transplanting, everything was done in the hospital. Everything. Everything. Even if you're having an autologous transplant. And now with all these new ways of doing transplant and supporting the patient after a transplant, the vast majority of autologous transplants in this country are done as outpatients. And many of the allogeneic transplants are starting to be moved, or at least portions of this move to the outpatient setting. So that has been a huge advance for us, and it helps patients recover faster. I want to tell you a little bit about the conditioning regimens or preparative regimens that change. And the big one uh, over the past decade is what we call non-myeloblative or reduced or mini. Have you heard of a mini transplant? 
It just means that the doses of chemotherapy, and this is typically used for an allogeneic transplant using someone else's, is that we try to lower the doses of chemotherapy and also lower if your transplant center uses radiation to small amounts. And the main goal is to get your body, your immune system, reduced enough that it'll say, come on in and grow. Come on in and grow new cells. Come on in. That's fine. And it works best for patients whose diseases aren't growing very quickly or older patients who have other health problems because you're kind of reducing the doses, making it more gentle to them. And the big benefit of that is to try to get those new cells to grow in and you're counting that they can help keep the cancer away. The traditional type of regimen that was always used from the 1980s on are huge doses of chemotherapy and radiation. So they're not only dropping down the immune system to get new cells to grow in, but really also trying to get rid of all the cells. But as they do that, they get rid of all your healthy cells. They really destroy the bone marrow. And so we use these type of regimens for patients that have very aggressive disease, really need those huge doses of chemotherapy and radiation. And those who are younger and overall healthy, their body, that they can withstand that, because it usually does call more side effects. So you've heard about this allogeneic transplant of either a family a donor, that can be a perfectly matched family donor, or a half-matched. And then we've talked about unrelated. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more about unrelated transplant here. So my gosh, there's all these options. You know, somehow, sometimes you want to go into um, a, a big department store because you've got all these options. But that can be a little confusing sometimes if you have two choices. I'll take the red dress instead of the blue. You know, you're just as happy sometimes with two choices. But one thing about transplant, are there lots of choices? And the good thing is that you've got a medical team that's going to help decide and give you the best advice. So when you need a transplant, an unrelated transplant, and a family member is not able to donate to you, your transplant center will help you decide about doing an unrelated transplant. And I think the take-home message, and this is something, something that we need to have a take-home message, is for your family doctors as well, who may see you when you're first diagnosed, is to get you to a transplant center because things have changed so much. And the advances in, in what we call HLA typing to help find you your best match, these new regimens I've been talking about, the new ways to support the patient, that when I first started, if you need an unrelated transplant, you just kind of cringed a little bit inside. You know, it was going to be a tough haul. But now, with all these changes, the outcomes, if you need an unrelated transplant, are really comparable to a family donor for many diseases. So not having a family donor should not be a reason to consider a transplant in 2016. So how do we find an unrelated donor, or how do we find a cord blood, all right? So your transplant center will work with the National Marrow Donor Program to do that. And essentially, as you heard earlier, they'll take a blood sample or a swab. There's this huge biorepository in Minneapolis where swabs have been collected from donors from around the world. It's just huge. You can imagine this big factory of people in and these swabs coming in and going out, these huge internal freezers. That's what it is. And it is all computerized. Everything is on a computer. And so this is called Be The Match Registry, and it has 12 and a half million people, donors in it, and over 200,000 cord blood units. And internationally, we have access to 25 million potential donors and over half a million cord blood units. The United States, the largest cord blood banks are in New York, St. Louis, Duke, others around the country. And those cord blood units have been donated and they're already typed. Already done. And you can move to a cord blood transplant in a couple days. They're already banked. They've already been typed. They just shipped overnight. So we do the searching behind the scenes. So you heard a little bit about HLA. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit more about it. There have been a huge number of advances over the years. We used to look at six major HLA proteins. Then it moved to eight. Then it moved to 10. And now many centers are using 12. 
and it went just from like a little cursory high level view down to teeny tiny minute view. And so it is a huge field. There are people just specialize at NMDP in, in around the world in understanding HLA. I, I don't understand anything about it, but I can tell you about it, okay? So those are the proteins that you saw. They're on the surface of our cells. And our immune system uses them. Like, are you, you, are you, do you look like me or do you, are you a stranger? That's the bottom line. That's how we figure out whose cell. And HLA is important for graft-versus-host disease. Does the new cells, the graft, recognize you, the host, as being foreign? And that's what that, using that cyclophosphamide, that's just been a phenomenal change to do that three days after, to try to get rid of some of those cells that cause graft-versus-host disease. But there's a whole bunch of them. And one of the changes that's occurred over the past few years is we know that DP, this one called DP, can be really important. And there are some changes that are good, what's called permissive, and some not so good. So we can better match a donor for you, and that reduces complications. And that's been a huge advance over the years. And so here's what they look like. There's just zillions of them. And the possible sets, these top the types are in the billions. So it's just not a few. I talked about 8, 10, 12. There's billions of them. And so when you think about a lottery, I, I hate that kind of connotation, but that's kind of what we use. You, I mean, there's this huge number of, of combinations. That's what it is. And they often follow ethnic groups. Do you know? So the Caucasians, we have a, a better chance of finding a donor than Hispanics, African American, Asian Pacific Islanders. There's a huge number of Caucasians. Most of us are from Europe, and there's huge registries in Europe. So it, there's just huge, it's just billions. And when we look at the Be The Match registry, it's something that we're really working on to try to increase the ethnic diversity. So if you look at all, I told you about the billions of, of donors out there, that 60% of them are from Caucasian background, 27% from ethnic groups, and 13% declined to say. But that's one thing that can be good about a cord blood. Let's say you don't have a family member that can donate to you. That the ethnic diversity of our cord blood units is much higher. And so that's been really great for African American, Hispanics, Asian Pacific Islanders, so that if you're from an ethnic diverse background, it actually can be more likely that you may find cord blood units to help you do a transplant. So I'm going to just now switch over and just tell you a little bit about how NMDP can assist you and, and your transplant center and your primary hematology oncology doctors. So that we have, um, uh, this, was, <laughs> this is uh, Jill Randall. She was actually one of my social workers at the University of Minnesota, and we both moved over to the National Marrow Donor Program. So I smile when I see her, because now she's a social worker at the National Marrow Donor Program. But they can provide one-on-one -on -one support. We have tailored educational materials. We have financial resources, so we have programs to help patients do HLA typing of family members and for unrelated if you don't have insurance or until insurance comes through. So we have full financial resources for you. We can help you about fundraising to a, a appeal and insurance denial. We have a peer-to-peer -peer con connection. You just want to talk to somebody that the exact same kind of disease you did, that the same age you have. So many of your institutions have that, but we have national resources and, can, and put you in with somebody that is in, uh, near your home. I think somebody that's often been forgotten are those that care for those, the caregivers, family members that really step forward. And we have a, a support system for them as well. We have pre-transplant patient materials. We have a variety of booklets. Um, we have us all written in easy to understand language and we have almost all of our resources in Spanish. We also have on our staff foreign language experts that can also speak to patients and families with foreign language needs. We talk about autologous transplant, allogeneic transplant, being a transplant caregiver. We also have videos to watch. Uh, we have post-transplant materials for patients. We have fact sheets on this graft versus host disease. These are updated every year. 
We also have a newsletter series that just, it also includes both autologous and allogeneic transplant. It comes uh, six issues a year, it has caregivers, and it autom can be automatically sent to you and it's free. We also, those of you who are a little tech savvy, you can download everything on a mobile app. And this helps you keep track of things that maybe you need to have checkups done, how to survive and keep yourself healthy after transplant. We also have them for your physicians. They're online, print, and as an app. We have free webcast for patients and their families. Um, staying healthy after transplant, journey ahead, taking care of yourself. Chronic graft versus host disease can be a big thing for survivors of transplant. We have full series on those as well. So just to sum up, I think the future is very, very bright. I think that research has tremendously advanced the field, and if you've just heard that there should be a donor for every patient that needs a transplant in, in 2016. We couldn't have even said that five years ago. Your transplant team will help sort out whether or not an autologous transplant is better for you, if an allogeneic, going down the list, what would be the best options you know, for you, whether or not it's a family donor, umbilical cord, matched unrelated transplant. And it's really going to allow more patients to be cured of their disease. So age should not be a limitation. A donor should not be a limitation. And research really going to enable us to understand and improve outcomes that matter most to patients. We've just been awarded a two-year grant and effort, and we're working with patients. Patients are engaged with us in research. We've just formed six teams, research teams, with patients and caregivers. What we heard is that you need more help from your transplant centers preparing for a transplant. We know that after transplant, that emotional health, physical health, cognitive. We've heard patients say, I can't think as well. I had a chef a woman who was a chef. And after transplant, she had even difficulty following recipes. It's something that we need to pay attention to and we need to improve. Our other working group is on financial hardships. There have been patients who have undergone allogeneic transplants that have, that have gone bankrupt. We've got to stop that. And so patients are telling us what matters most to them. And we're going to be starting to collecting that type of information through our research data. So take home points. Be the match helps transplant centers identify unrelated, unrelated sources, and that may be a person or cord blood. That survival following an unrelated transplant in this day and age is really pretty similar to match sibling. And studies are being done. We are actually working with a multi-center effort group to look at um, matched uh, versus haplo. And we're also starting to think, can we use that cyclophosphamide after transplant for mismatched? We can't find anybody that we can really continue to cross the barriers. We have a lot of programs to help you and your family along the journey. They're free. So I hope you'll take advantage of them, and we do.